Praise the Lord. Thank you so much for uh, allowing me to be the first speaker tonight. Uh, just one or two things. First of all, it's a real pleasure to work with Jim and Paul and uh, Ian on the CMFI Council. Um, I j we just need you to know, you know, we have such a sense of unity and, and it's a real, real blessing to, uh, to be with these uh, brothers. And... Um, you know, unity doesn't always mean you always agree on everything, but you can be agreeably disagreeable and still get the will of God. <laughs> Amen. Now, I wanted to just read you something before we start. Um, th there's, uh, first of all, it's lovely to have Pastor Moses here Amen. from Kenya and all the different, but it's great to renew fellowship with everyone. Uh, lovely having John praying. Whenever John, I phone up John, I say, is that John Haywood? This is John Wayward, sweetie. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, <laughs> that's just our joke. Um, um, so here we go. Um, Dear Reverend John, greetings in Jesus' precious name. I'm writing to express my gratitude to God and also to register my goodwill message towards the long-expected 22nd to 24th of September 2016 CMFI conference in the UK. I'm quite hopeful that the blessings of God through the conference will be great and shall reach out to all in attendance. Although I'm unable to attend the conference in person, my heart is there with you. Some of our members here in Lagos really desire to attend the conference too, but we are financially constrained. I believe God, in the near future, we should be able to attend the conference and also partake from the blessings of it as released by God to everyone there. I wish you all a highly scriptural, insightful and supernaturally impactful it's a lovely, yeah? gathering in God's presence. Lagos region, wish you all abundance and unusual blessings during the conference. Also, we believe that as we shall also gather in his presence during our one day regional conference on the 19th of November 2016, God shall also visit us in a, well, he says a strange way. I hope it's not too strange. <laughs> We love you all. Lagos region salute you. Remain richly blessed. Pastor David Brooks, Lagos regional representative. I thought you might like to, uh, just to, uh, to know about that. Isn't that lovely? Mm. So um, uh, all these brethren will be praying for us and we'll be uh, uh, praying for them. Mm. Um, just to put the record straight, um, Mary and I have not retired, we have retired, T-Y-R-E-D, that's a totally different thing. So we're, we're handing over at the church in South of Reading in the new year to uh, Pastor Dion, and he'll be the lead pastor, he's been in training for five or six years, and we finished 40 years there. 40 seems a good time to hand over, it's a good biblical number, and um, there are many precedents in God's word. On January the 7th, Saturday, we have a celebration of 40 years of ministry there. So if any of you can come, don't wait for the invitation to come. Just put it in your diary and come. We'd love to see you there. And then on the 8th, we shall do whatever we have to do, laying hands on, on Dion. Pray for him for, for wisdom. Um, he, I, said, I said to Dion this week, Dion, it's too late to change your mind now. You can't burn. Well, you burnt your bridges. You're in the hot seat. We're on sabbatical for just three months and we're not even at the church so anything that happens he's got to keep an eye on it amen, amen. and uh, I said we're only a phone call away but uh, but that's it you you know and that's a kind of trial run I did originally say a dummy run but that doesn't mean Dion's a dummy but it's uh, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway that's where it's at you know and um, all of us go through seasons in life there comes times when we change to so everything there is a season under the sun and uh, we have to discern what season we are in or what is the timing of God what is happening at the moment there are the word of God talks about times and seasons um, a time is a chronos on in God's word which is something on the clock so the chronos is just after quarter to nine but the season is something that is appropriate for what God is wanting to do at that specific time amen, amen. so I believe the season now it is to prepare God's people uh, of just uh, for the final run-in before the Lord Jesus returns. That's the season. So um, it's a great season to be in. And uh, the Lord has something for every one of us here to do. Amen. If he didn't, he'd take us home straight away. But he's left us here to serve him. And we'll try and get on to some of that. Let's just pray together. 
Father, we thank you for uh, the word of God, which is able to build us up and to give us an inheritance yeah. amongst those who are being sanctified. Forever it is settled in heaven, Lord. It is yes. not just truth, but the truth. Mm. We thank you, Lord, uh, for the living word, and we thank you for the written word. And, Lord, we thank you that the written word and the living word always agree. Praise your name. You. So, Lord, just now we ask you that... Um, by faith we'll enter into the anointing that you have for this meeting and Father that uh, somehow we'll be able to just share something of the treasures of your word and I pray that you'll bless and build up uh, your saints here Lord, your people here and we'll be able to take something away which will be of value in the days which lie ahead. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now if you have a Bible that's really helpful. Um, somebody said once that we have preachers to help us misunderstand what God has written in his word. I hope that isn't true. But um, just as a precursor, um, um, I'm going to um, share about the Bride of Christ tonight. That's really the theme, but I want to share a few things in advance of that. So we're going to Ephesians chapter 5, and then I'm going to take you back to the... Um, theme uh, which uh, I think somebody prayed out in a prayer here I think it was Greg and uh, the theme of, of this weekend is uh, thanks be to God which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ and we specifically uh, agreed in the council uh, that we would try and be very positive in this conference you know, there's so many things out there that it's easy to be negative over, and sometimes we have to be, but I want to try and be very positive tonight. But we're reading from Ephesians chapter 5. And you'll get the picture. Um, I think we'll start at let's, verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. If, if the church were totally subject to the headship of Christ, you'd see a very different church in our nation. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That is the objective for the bride of Christ. That's God's intention, that's his purpose, uh, part of his eternal purpose. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loves his wife loves himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Leave and cleave, it's called. Where you don't leave and cleave, you have problems. A lot of people leave, but they don't cleave. And then it says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and uh, the church. Uh, there are 18 mysteries in the Word of God. Um, we haven't got time to go into them all, but the church is one of the uh, mysteries, and uh, uh, I'm sure you'll know many of them. But to really go back to the theme to start us off, I, I want us to look at the Bride of Christ because uh, it very much reflects the victory that has been won for us on Calvary. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15:57. Now, if you study the word victory as it stands, it occurs 12 times in the Bible, six in the Old Testament and six in the New Testament. And, and, and it, it's wonderful um, uh, picture there. David's mighty men, um, uh, when um, uh, David fought, um, uh, uh, it, the word victory is there. Um, the only, uh, there's a lovely one in Revelation about where they got victory uh, over the beast. 
And uh, throughout the Word of God, you'll find victory. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Uh, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4. Uh, and um, in 1 Corinthians 15 here, um, victory actually appears three times. And I'm trying to look at the end of the story tonight because I want us to be encouraged that we finish up in victory because of a victory that has already been won. And it says here, O death, where is thy string? sting? O grave, where is your victory? Death is swallowed up in victory. Um, but thanks be to God which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And in fact, one of those victory passages about death in Isaiah 25a is actually repeated in 1 Corinthians 15. Because the Bible is one whole, the new is in the old concealed, the old is in the new revealed. So that is the word victory. And we finish up with victory. But then there is another word that takes us beyond victory, and it is the word triumph. You heard the word triumph? And the word triumph appears 13 times in the Word of God. Uh, for, um, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. And we can go through um, different places where the word triumph comes. Uh, in the New Testament, um, the word triumph appears twice. I'll show you where it is. 2 Corinthians 2.14 it's a beautiful verse. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us what? To triumph in Christ and makes manifest the savour of his knowledge. How? By us in every place. In other words, where we are makes a difference because we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And then the other place you'll find it is in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15. And um, these verses give us the basis of the triumph. And there is a difference between a victory and a triumph, which I'll explain in a moment. But Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15 gives us this tremendous statement here. He, the, uh, Paul the writer here it tells us three things that Jesus did upon the cross. Uh, first of all, he blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. In other words, the law that condemned us. He, he took away uh, uh, the sting of that law uh, by nailing it to his cross. Incidentally, we need to be careful we don't go back under law. Nothing wrong with the law. And the Holy Spirit helps us to keep the law of God. But we are not going back under law. Because we've been given a covenant which is far better, according to Hebrews. Better than Moses. Um, second, um, um, sorry, I forgot the first one. Having forgiven you all trespasses. That's lovely, isn't it? So it's the sins are dealt with, the law is dealt with. And then in verse 15, he makes this tremendous statement, which excites me hugely. And having spoiled or stripped principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in him, in it or in himself. And so the wonderful thing there is that whilst Jesus appeared to be losing on the cross, he was actually winning. He was actually winning. The powers of darkness thought that they had defeated him, but actually he was creating a, a, a legal blow upon them which would last from that moment right through the age and right through into eternity. Uh, and uh, that triumph um, although it's not manifested fully yet, will be manifested um, in the future. And um, at the moment, um, it, not everything appears to be under his rule, but there is a time coming uh, when that will happen. And, and 1 Corinthians 15, 24 tells us uh, that when this will happen, afterwards they that are Christ that is coming, then cometh the end. So what is the end? Well, there's a little bit more to go yet. But when Jesus comes back, he'll reign upon the earth. And then all principality and power will finally be put down. When he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all his enemies his feet. And Psalm 2 tells us, doesn't it, uh, that um, sit thou on my right hand until I make all uh, your enemies my footstool. Okay, what is the difference between a victory and a triumph? 
Very simple. A, a victory is when you win, but a triumph is when you bring your spoils back with you. Uh, so a Roman commander would win and then he, he'd bring a triumphal procession behind him of everything that he had captured and gained uh, within that war. So there is a difference uh, between a victory and a triumph. And then there is another word that is very similar linguistically to these words, and it is the word overcome. I love that word overcome, overcome, associated word. And that appears uh, 34 times in the Bible, sometimes reflecting the same Greek and Hebrew roots. And um, you'll find that in different places. Uh, for example, in Genesis, I think it's 49, 19, one of the tribes was called Gad. He, sh um, uh, he shall be overcome, but he will overcome at the last. I think of Caleb, we are well able to overcome them. I love that, so positive, and we are well able to overcome. And then we can go into the New Testament and we'll find the word overcome. In the world you shall have tribulation, flipsis, pressure, but be of good cheer, I have overcome uh, the world. Uh, Romans 12, 21, don't be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. So we can overcome, that's, that's for sure, uh, and uh, that's good news. And when you go through the book of Revelation to the seven churches, you'll find again and again and again this overcome, to him that overcometh. I heard a preacher say once that there's only two choices, we're either overcomers or we're overcome. I think that's a fair comment, isn't it? But we can overcome, with the Lord we can overcome and we can triumph. And then in the first epistle of John, uh, just to continue this, and this is a theme within itself really, uh, there's some wonderful verses in, 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 uh, in John. And I can tell you, we've been 40 years in a church, you can overcome every situation or circumstance. I've discovered that God does not have problems, he has solutions. And number two, he's always a step ahead of where we are. He's always anticipating what the solution will be, even if we cannot see it. That's wonderful, isn't it? He, I call him the third day God, because he plans often three days ahead. If you look through the Bible, you'll find many places where, where three days ahead, God had something very different in mind. It's a great message if for those of you who are preachers. Okay, so let's just quickly look at 1 John and then we'll just try and quickly get into our theme. Uh, 1 John chapter 2. Now here's some wonderful verses uh, about overcoming. Uh, the epistle, uh, first epistle of John is, is a beautiful but I love John's writings. Not just because my name is John but uh, I, I happen to, to, to like it. And um, we used to go to Assemblies of God Church in Bracknell and every time we went in, the, the man who was the elder there said there was a man sent from God, his name was John. <laughs> so he had to live up to something there. But he, just listen to these verses. 1 John chapter 2. Uh, I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto little children because you have known the Father. I have written unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. It's all to do with overcoming. And you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. If the word of God abides in us, then we can overcome. That's the only way to overcome. Um, uh, the Word of God is, is sadly neglected in many places today. But the, Jesus said in Matthew 4, For man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, including the ones we don't like, or the ones that are controversial, shall, not live, shall live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And we have to acquaint ourselves with everything that this book says, the whole counsel of God. And then 1 John 4 verse 4, uh, just meditate on these, I'm not really preaching, I'm just drawing attention. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Specifically speaking about the spirit of Antichrist, actually the previous verses, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. It says in Proverbs, the, the righteous flee, sorry, the wicked flee when, when no man pursueth, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. 
So we actually have a lion within us. That's not, a, that's not a, an invitation to roar like some people do. I don't believe God works like that. But someone said once, if Jesus is our rock, shouldn't we be a little bolder? <laughs> so uh, he's, he's within us, isn't he? And it's wonderful to know that, that the Son of God is within us. And then 1 John 4, uh, so we've d done that one. 1 John um, 5 verse 4 just to finish off the overcoming verses. For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Isn't that lovely? So who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. And then... Um, I think that's probably all of them I, I need to tell you. But I'm telling you this because, because at the end we overcome. We can overcome now. It doesn't mean we have an easy life or an easy run. And um, if you go to the end of the book, the good news is we win. <laughs> because we have already won. Um, I was privileged for many years to be um, uh, on uh, Derek Prince's UK board and it was a great privilege and um, uh, one day I think it was a man in Jerusalem who was a devil worshipper uh, came to him uh, and he thought how do I get through to this man so he presented him with Satan's program for the end of the age and God's program for the end of the age and the answer is we win <laughs> and the man got converted because he realised that Satan's program was going to fail and uh, we need to be aware of both those programs. And so the true church at the end of the age moves into a triumphant position. I'm not talking about triumphalism. There's a hymn, I don't know whether you sing it, "'Tis the church triumphant singing, worthy is the Lamb." And why are we triumphant? We are triumphant because of the Lamb of God, and he has triumphed. And when we come to know him, his history becomes ours when we are placed in him. There's no other way. In fact, God only deals with two people, do you know that? Adam or Jesus. You're right. If you're in Adam and you're not in Jesus, then, then you're finished. But if you're in Christ, um, you can uh, have complete victory. And, and it's good to, to read the end of the book, particularly the bride, because um, the bride is one of the chief constituent factors of what is mentioned at the end of the book of Revelation. And if we get there tonight, we'll see that um, uh, the, the bride comes down from the heavenly city to earth. Isn't that wonderful? And we are destined to be part of that bride. That's good news. Uh, so I want to tell you we've got a good future. Okay, so now what I want to show you now, let's just go to the book of Ephesians. Uh, I'll try and watch the time. But um, um, what I want to show you tonight is really um, what does God require of that bride? How do we uh, uh, fulfill our ministry to become, to really be an essential part of that bride? That's the, the message tonight. Uh, and what a wonderful future we have. Uh, the Word of God says that I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those that love him. What a wonderful future we have. You know, sometimes people go home to be with the Lord and we grieve for them, but we shouldn't do that. Because, you know, to, to be with Christ is far better. Uh, and um, it, 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 the, the Word of God says in Romans 8.18 8, that the, I re, Paul said, I reckon that the sufferings of this present life are nothing to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. And sometimes we underestimate what our future is going to be. Uh, and I, I want us to really try and focus where we're aiming for tonight. Uh, even in CMFI, we're aiming uh, to be uh, uh, an essential part of that bride and to understand what our future is in Jesus Christ. What a wonderful future. And John 16, 14 says, when the Holy Spirit comes, what will he do? He will show you things to come. Hallelujah. We know what's coming. Hallelujah. Both bad and good. <laughs> we know what's coming. Now in the book of Ephesians, which I'd like to take you to, um, we haven't got time to go into all of this, but Ephesians is a, is a very wonderful epistle. It's the highlight of what the uh, church should be. And in the epistle to the um, Ephesians, you'll find actually seven pictures of God's people. Everything's sevens, by the way. 
I, I love this. It's it, it, Revelation's all sevens. Why is it sevens? Because seven is the number of completion and perfection. I think the only thing that isn't seven in Revelation is the mark of the beast, which is 666. And the name of Jesus, the gematria of which is 888. And I love that because that's one more than perfection, which is triple resurrection. And I Bible numbers are great, provided you don't get Kabbalistic about them. <laughs> okay, so, okay, so in the book of Revelation, well, you have seven pictures um, of the Church of Jesus Christ there. Just quickly tell you what they are. And if, if you look at these pictures, um, what it's good to do is to... Um, First of all, find out what the picture is. And then secondly, um, uh, the, the question we must ask is, see, everyone says, well, what do I get out of coming to church? You hear people say that? I didn't get anything out of it. Well, you don't come to church to get something out of it. You come to church to, get, to put something into it. And most of all, we have to see what does God want out of it. Uh, we have to be uh, um, Christocentric and not egocentric. And then the third thing we would have to ask as you look at those pictures is what does God require of me to enable that picture of his church to be fulfilled? That, that, that exercise will keep us going until the rapture, whenever that is. Okay, so, so there's different pictures of the church um, in the um, uh, book of Ephesians. First one is the assembly, the ecclesia, the called out ones. We are called out. And um, the Ecclesia represents to the world God's authority. God is a God of authority and divine order. And a lot of that order is impugned today. Some of the worst moments we have in our church, or have had over 40 years, is when people disrespect God's authority and the way that authority should be communicated. Uh, and that authority, uh, we see, comes actually through submitting to God, submitting to delegated authority, submitting to the headship of Jesus. So authority. And so that requires that we are in divine order. I discovered something the word chaos is the name of a Greek God did you know that yes. chaos is a Greek God a lot of things in church is chaos I, I, don't, I may tread on your toes but I've got no time for messy church because it suggests total chaos and disorder and I believe our children need to be disciplined and orderly uh, second picture I'll just quickly go through these Ephesians 1.23, the church which is his body. That's another one of the seven pictures. And a body is there to carry out the will of the head. My body here is carrying out the messages that my head sends uh, down to it. So it's the executive agent of God, if you like. And the thing that God then requires of us uh, when we are in the body is availability. Uh, uh, the, the big thing, not ability, but availability. And it's the relationship of members to the head and to each other. So we are interdependent as the people of God. And so we have to be in relationship to each other. And in Colossians, one of the problems is, it says, not holding the head by which the whole body by joints and bonds grows. Amen. What are the joints and the bonds? A very simple, my body is held together by joints and bonds. I've had a bit of trouble with a joint in this one. Uh, I better not tell you why. But, uh, <laughs> well, I've been doing high kicks and I'm getting told <laughs> off for that. But the joints are the relationships, the bonds are the attitudes. So that's important. And then uh, the, the, uh, a third one is Ephesians 2.10, we are his workmanship. It's a beautiful one, isn't it? We are his workmanship. The Greek word is poema, from which we get the word poem. Uh, and um, that speaks of, of really God's creative genius within, within our midst. And, and in order for God to have workmanship, we have to be pliable or yielded and ready to change. If we are resistant to change, we are resistant to God, I believe. We are being changed from glory to glory uh, through the Holy Spirit. We haven't got time to go into all these, I just want to tell you them quickly. Ephesians 2.19, the household or the family. Uh, and uh, the family, that, uh, what does that gain for God? It displays God's grace. He is proud of his children and he wants to show them off in a proper way uh, to the universe. And he's willing to have us as his children and to show them off. Isn't that wonderful? 
and he does uh, God's you know God's purpose is to show us off also to the principalities and powers because Ephesians 3 10 says to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers might be shown the many-sided wisdom of God how does he do it he does it through his church when we flow together under headship and so the, the family there um, um, and so what does that require of us very simple maturity we have to grow up a lot of the church has never grown up it, it's in infancy uh, and we need to stop running around in nappies and grow up uh, and it, uh, much of the church is, is retarded in its growth never grows up Amen. Fifth one is the temple. I'll just go through these quickly. 221, a dwelling place for God to, to be in. And if we could just see that every time we come together, it's a dwelling place of God's Holy Spirit. Therefore, we want to be sensitive to what God is doing. A dwelling place. And to be a dwelling place, God uses living stones. So we have to be adjusted, fitted together. Sometimes chips have to be knocked off the bricks to fit them together. Amen. Awkward things chopped off. Now, uh, the seventh one is implied. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. That's an army. Church is supposed to be an army. And that reflects God's victory and military power, and particularly to the principalities and powers. And uh, we don't win every battle, but we, we win the main one at the end, because it's already won. And uh, to be in an army, you have to be disciplined. Discipline is, is a far short in the Church of Jesus Christ today. Um, how is that manifested? Well, at least if we could start at half past ten every week, it would show something of discipline. Sure. How we leave the church buildings, discipline, order. But the lovely one is, is the bride. And um, uh, the, the bride is a beautiful picture, it's a future picture. And uh, the bride, uh, what, does, what does the bride what is it supposed to reflect of God? It's supposed to reflect his glory. Amen. Amen. And why is, how do I know that? Because, uh, because in Corinthians and Ephesians, it says that the woman is the glory of the man. Sure. And so therefore, Christian marriage, a husband and wife, is a picture of Christ and his church. We read that together. And, and if we can understand that, it's, it, 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 it shows us wonderful truth. And so, uh, um, if, if, the, if a woman uh, is to reflect God's glory, that's a huge responsibility on the man. Be because if the woman is all shriveled up and sad and all the rest of it, it reflects something of a husband. Someone said to Billy Graham once, isn't so-and-so a good brother? He said, I don't know. He said, I've never met his wife. <laughs> and I think that's, uh, that's true. Behind every uh, a man is a wife. So the woman is the glory of the man. Uh, and uh, submission, uh, submissiveness is a principle which actually starts in the Godhead. People don't like to talk about submission, but the Spirit submits to the Son, the Son submits to the Father. It's a principle within uh, the Godhead. And we need to see it in the church, submitting one to another, not just for the sake of it, but in the fear of God. That's the reason why we, we do it. And so um, we have these, these pictures here. So um, uh, the bride uh, is, is an extremely important picture. I must just try and watch the time. What time do we finish? I think we said 50 minutes. I'll try. So there's, um, uh, there's a lovely um, song we used to sing called Here Comes the Bride. They would always play that. I won't give you all the words that they used to add to it. But um, some years ago, um, a, a lady was visiting our church with a, with a man, a well-known man, I won't mention his name, he had a ministry in the Arab world to, to, to Muslims. Uh, and at the end, she, she came to me and she said this, it really encouraged me. She said, I sense in my heart that the spirit of the bride is amongst you. I tell you, that excited me. That excited me. Uh, because uh, it... it it testified to something that she sensed within her spirit, um, in her heart. Uh, and uh, um, sometime previously to that, a brother had, uh, had approached uh, me and he said he felt God had visited him one day. I don't know how he visited him. And he said, I want my church to be rapture ready. I want my church to be rapture ready. So I believe those who are walking with the Lord are now sensing that the coming of the Lord draws near and our responsibility is to prepare our hearts as uh, the bride of Christ. Um, 
sad that one charismatic leader in the house churches described the rapture as a myth and a hoax. <laughs> I find that astonishing. But anyway, uh, the true church will honour God's word. And so we need to look at the bride of Christ. Now at the end of this age, there will only be two groups. Uh, one is a bride and the other is a harlot or a prostitute. Um, we had a wonderful message at our church where you were there, the four women of Revelation. It was uh, such a blessing. Do you know there are four women in Revelation? Two are good and two aren't. Uh, the Jezebel in Thyatira was a bad one. <laughs> you suffer that woman Jezebel. And then the sun-clothed woman in Revelation 12, which is Israel. And then in, in Revelation um, 17 and 18, we, we have another mystery, which is a harlot church, a prostitute church, written in capital letters in your Bible. And then the fourth woman is in Revelation 19, and she is a bride. Too good, too bad. And um, so, um, uh, really, uh, what is happening, there's a divide happening. This is what CMFI is about. There is a divide in the church of Jesus Christ, and it's the preparation of the bride for the return of the Lord, or the Harlot Church. There won't be denominations at the end. That's where we're, we're headed. Uh, and um, there's a few things from even from the book of Ephesians that we can learn about being prepared as a bride. Because when you get to Revelation 19.7, it says the marriage of the Lamb is come. And what? His wife, the church, has made herself ready. So, so we're in a preparation time now. We need to understand that. Um, we can get phased by everything that's going on in the world, but w w positively we need to be allowing the Holy Spirit to prepare us as a bride, to prepare as a bride. Okay, now just one or two things about this bride. I mustn't go on too long. But Ephesians chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. Uh, and these are some of the things that, um, that we could say are vitally necessary, particularly for us in CMFI, uh, to be ready uh, for when the Lord returns. So let's just have a look at one or two of these. First of all, Ephesians 5, 23, 24, the true church is subject to the head, the Lord Jesus Christ, in all things. Someone said once, the problem in the church today is that we have de decapitated the head. We cut him out. We do not go to the head. We do not seek the Lord. We have decapitated um, and the headship of Jesus Christ. And the real issue is not actually gifts of the Spirit or tongues as blessed as they are, but who is the head of the church? That's going to be the issue at the end of the day. It isn't the Pope, that's for sure. <laughs> But sometimes there are Protestant popes as well. And uh, we want to make sure we know uh, who the head of the church is. So how is that worked out in assembly life? How is that worked out in my home, in my family and all aspects of my life? And particularly in assembly life, you know, if everyone went into an assembly meeting, was looking to the Lord, the Spirit of God will flow. We, I think we sensed that last Sunday. We've had two Sundays when... You know, there's always someone's got to interrupt, haven't they? We're just as the Holy Spirit's moving. And there's a wonderful sense of God's presence. And, and then someone stands up and prays about great Aunt Fanny's kneecap or something like that. But, but really, we, we had complete silence, didn't we, in that meeting for about 10 minutes. It was wonderful. Uh, and um, it was the headship of Jesus. And then the church is sanctified and cleansed, how? With the washing of water by the word. In the tabernacle, if you've ever studied that, and there are, over, there are 40 chapters concerning the tabernacle, when you went in, you went in through, uh, there were f four pillars representing the four Gospels, and then you came to the brazen altar, which represents the cross, and then before you could go into the holy place, and the holiest of all, you came to a, a, a brazen laver which was made of the women's looking glasses. <laughs> and and you, the priest had to wash. You had to wash yourself before you could get into the holy place and the holiest of all. And the word of God here says that, that, that how does he sanctify and cleanse it? With the washing of water by the word. So the word of God has to be, uh, have a preeminent place within our assemblies and within our lives. 
And so it's cleansed with the washing of water. A lot of places have thrown the Bible out. We've got to move of the Spirit. We don't read the Bible any longer. Well, I find that strange because the Spirit and the Word always um, agree together according to the, uh, God's own Word. And then he says that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Isn't that wonderful? So, so part of this has to be holiness. It ha we have to have a preparation. Uh, and there are many other places we could pursue this theme all night, but we're, uh, for the sake of time, um, uh, we, we haven't got time to do that. Uh, but um, uh, I've discovered, uh, e even in the Old Testament, you know, there are seven types of the church contained in the Old Testament. So I'll tell you them very quickly before we just finish. Eve is a type of the church. Adam was put to sleep and out of his side came Eve. Out of his side, the place nearest his heart. That's what the church should be, near the heart of God. Bone of his bone. Isn't that wonderful? And so marriage is a picture of, 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 of the church, a supreme type of the church. Um, somebody said this once in jest that um, Adam was the first person who had a loudspeaker made out of his side, but please don't quote me on that. Um, and then we have Rebecca. We have Rebecca in uh, Genesis 22, united to the heavenly man, Isaac, who is a type of the son. Beautiful picture, a chaste virgin. And they sent out Eliezer, the Holy Spirit, to get a bride uh, for, uh, for Rebecca. Uh, and when they came, they, uh, they brought not only raiment, but they brought gifts, let me say that. The, the, the bride should be adorned with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I'm not a cessationist because 1 Corinthians 1 7 says this so that you come behind in no gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the gifts exalt Jesus but they are supposed to be there within uh, the church. Uh, and, and so and she, she was called by Eliezer which means helper, and the Holy Spirit's a helper, to go and meet a man who she'd never met, but he, all she did was took uh, his report of that man and went back, and they were beautifully married. I, I haven't got time to go into the typology. Asenath, the wife for Joseph, who was also a type of Christ, giving him satisfaction and uh, fruitfulness. Zipporah, wife of Moses, a type of Jesus and a companion of his rejection. If you gave me another two hours, we could unpack them, but we can't. Ruth, a Gentile bride, being led to Boaz, a Jewish man of wealth, showing the divine way to union and devotedness. Isn't that beautiful? These pictures, these shadows there. Abigail, joined to David, who's another type of Christ, showing appreciation of Christ when everything is against it. We are saved to serve. And then, of course, the Shulamite in the Song of Solomon, the delight of relationship and communion, Christ as head, uh, known at last, and all the resultant fruits that come out of that. Now we are espoused to Christ, according to Corinthians 11, and we have to be careful that we're not seduced away. Uh, but um, uh, God's plan for us is that we should be presented and that should, we should be uh, brought um, to the Lord Jesus. And there is a, a time coming uh, when um, uh, the, the, the bride is, we're going to be presented uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to come back, he's going to take that bride to be with himself. So we're totally submitted to Jesus in all things, number one. We are sanctified and cleansed by obeying the word of God. And then Revelation 19, um, I'd just like to show you that, and we're finished in Revelation here. Revelation 19, 7. Uh, and this is our future. What a wonderful future. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honour to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. And it says to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousnesses, is actually plural, righteousnesses. And so uh, it, 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 this is a wedding dress, it, it, it built into that are works that honour the Lord. 
Uh, they are, according to Ephesians 2, works that have been before prepared in Christ that we should walk in. Not dead works. We're not looking for that. We're looking for works that will honour him. And I pray in CMFI that will be, be the case. And of course she will be adorned with the grace gifts of the Holy Spirit uh, as Rebecca was given gifts. Um, and then we should be continually looking uh, for uh, the bridegroom. And in Revelation 19 uh, you see this um, a wonderful picture here. There are three times, you know, when heaven is told to rejoice. Did you know that? Number one, when Satan is cast out, chapter 12, 12. Number two, when literal Babylon is destroyed. Hope we're there to see that. And then thirdly, when the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife is ready. Now just finally, Revelation chapter 21. Because this is a wonderful privilege to be part of this bride. And I, I, I want to pray that we'll all be prepared. We'll get our hearts prepared for what's coming in the future. So in Revelation chapter 20, uh, we find the millennial reign of Christ, which is a literal reign of a thousand years when Satan is bound. So it could not not be the church age. Why? Because Satan is not bound now. Right. It's ridiculous. There are, uh, I think, five or six very strong, complete verbs there. Uh, and, and so um, that's the, the, the thousand year reign. In Revelation 21, uh, verse... Two, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God, out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And then in verse 9, there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. Isn't that lovely? Who's going to be part of the bride? We are. So therefore we need to take seriously uh, this revelation. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. What a wonderful place heaven is. Never, never stop anyone from going to heaven. Uh, and uh, from there the bride will come back down onto the earth. I, I believe uh, then uh, there, there's ages to come, which we don't know about. He's going to show us his grace in the ages to come. This Bible is just bypass meadow from man's sin through to, um, uh, through to uh, this particular point in Revelation. And the word of God says uh, that this, this bride will reign with him. We're going to fellowship with him throughout all ages. Hallelujah. So I want to leave that uh, with you and I pray that, um, uh, that you look forward to being part of that bride, that you'll prepare your hearts, uh, that in CMFI we will prepare our hearts and that we shall take seriously uh, the call uh, to be a bride and uh, that we shall play our part in the true church, the remnant church and that we shall, by faith, look forward to all the wonderful things that lie ahead. What a wonderful future and prospect we have. Yes. Nothing like it, and nothing earth offers. In fact, the more you go on with God, the, the less you want to stay here. Yes. Uh, really, uh, we just look forward to the things. May God detach us from the things of the world and the things of earth, and may we have that earnest desire within our hearts to, to be part of that lovely bride, which is going to be manifested but um, we, God cannot get a bride out of his son until we get into his son yeah. Amen so God bless you, God bless you. Mm.